Right. Uh, thanks, Leon, for the very nice introduction. And a big thank you to everyone who uh, supported the talk and so that I can be here today to share about uh, some work that I've done on this project. Uh, it's been a while since I worked on this project, since about 2011. Um, so before I go into the project itself about magic, I'd just like to give a quick recap on the state of the art in development of um, game AI. This is the sort of a branch of AI that focuses on um, having computers play certain games as well as people. Okay, so I'll uh, just start off with talking about a very old program that sort of got me inspired into this field. Uh, this is when I was, was when I was a kid. I was, this is a DOS program called Battle Chess. Not sure how many folks have seen this one. Uh, it's basically chess, except the, the units are those pixelized animated uh, uh, characters, and when they uh, when you you know attack a piece, there's some animation that happens. But that's about the graphical aspects. I think this was one of the first programs that I used that uh, had sort of a non-trivial component that sort of really impressed me. That the you know the computer opponents be really able to uh, at least play a very good game of chess against uh, a kid, right? Like who doesn't know chess that much? So um, games have often been used as sort of a benchmark of the progress in computing, and we've often seen big companies uh, put up exhibition matches. So one of the most famous um, examples reported in the media is, of course, the Kasparov uh, versus Deep Blue. So the two matches held. Uh, in the rematch, of course, Deep Blue won, and that was a major publicity boost for IBM, uh, who created Deep Blue. Uh, less well known, I think, it's, uh, and this is prior to uh, Kasparov versus Deep Blue, this is in 95, um, is actually Tinsley versus Chinook. Tinsley is the player on the right. Uh, on the left is Jonathan Schaefer, who wrote Chinook. Uh, it's from University of Al Alberta. And you will hear that name come up again later. Um, they actually fought to a draw in the 95 match, but Tinsley had to withdraw due to illness. So they had six games which were drawn. Um, checkers, this is a game of checkers, by the way. Um, and uh, checkers tend to lead to many draw games. And in fact, I think much later on, Schaefer's group proved that um, checkers, if played optimally, always leads to a draw. So it's always possible for the computer to draw with the player. Okay, but uh, Chinook was actually declared the uh, human computer champion in um, checkers. This is in 95. Uh, more recently, I might have heard of the 2011 exhibition match between IBM's Watson and the two best human Jeopardy players. Uh, this is the final question, I think, the final Jeopardy. And again, uh, we hear IBM doing a lot of work in this. Of course, and you hear more recently there's a lot of applications that they're trying to apply Watson into medical and other areas where natural language processing um, could be used. Right, so it does seem that from you know the three examples I showed earlier that uh, you know computers is pretty much computers humans like three to zero right so all these games they have um, been able to beat the best human um, players, but there's still a number of areas that are pretty much open to um, new work because humans are still much better than computers. And one of them is actually, this is a game of poker, uh, probably a very high stakes game, so I don't know how much money they're playing for. Uh, poker is tricky because uh, you have this imperfect information, right? So you don't get to see all the um, information on the board. So for example, in poker, you cannot see what's in your opponent's hand. Or unlike, for example, chess or checkers, right? Where you can see all the information at one time. So you often have to make some kind of assumptions or you have to um, work around the fact that you don't know exactly what your opponent has. So that makes it pretty hard for computers. And actually, if you follow the news, um, January this year, uh, again from the Poker Research Group at the University of Alberta, they published a paper um, showing that the, a very limited uh, form of poker called the um, hits up, hits up means two players, Limit means uh, you can only bet in a certain number of ways, and Hold'em poker is a particular variant, the Texas Hold'em variant of poker. So through quite a bit of effort in um, computer parallelization, distributed computing, and, and clever algorithms, they've actually solved this particular limited version of poker. This only works for two player, by the way. So if you have more than two players, as in normal games, um, this, uh, this result doesn't quite apply. But it's a, it's a breakthrough because this is the first um, game where you don't have all the information 
and which we could still solve um, a fairly simple version of this game. Okay, another game where uh, humans still hold the uh, top position is the game of Go, also called known as Wei Qi in China. And um, so why is this game? So this is a game of perfect information. It's kind of like checkers, right? You see, it's like a board, and you see all the pieces. But what's tricky about this is that just by looking at the board alone, it's really hard to tell um, who's ahead and who's behind. Because there's this localized um, battle, and, but then there's an overall effect um, of each of the localized um, battles that take place on the board. So it turns out to be a very tough problem at least to write a, a program that can look at a particular board and tell is it a good position or is it a bad position. So this makes it very hard. But it turns out that we're not really that far from um, being the, beating the world champion. A lot, of, a lot of research has gone into this. Uh, and this is a match between a program, Crazy Stone and Ishida Yoshio, who is a professional player in Japan. Um, and this is the initial position of the match. So Crazy Stone plays black, and it starts with four stones. So this is known as a four stone handicap. So because you know, the computers are not as good, we give them a little handicap to you know, have a little advantage. And in this particular configuration, um, Crazy Stone is actually able to win the professional player. So starting with four stones, next is um, the Ishida Yoshio's turn, and then Crazy Stone's turn, and so on. So the computer is playing black. So we're actually quite close, if you imagine, right? So you only need, the computer needs a four stone advantage to equal and beat um, the human player in Go. I think in this year's competition, they tried three stones, but the computer lost. So we're still, well, four might seem like a small gap, but if you look at you know, research, right, the last 10, 20% is always the, uh, the most difficult to push through. So there are actually certain advances in, in algorithms, in, in techniques that made this possible um, in the last uh, you know, four or five years. Okay, so now let me talk about <laughs> a game that's closer to my heart, uh, which is Magic the Gathering. Uh, it's a very old game, actually. It turns out uh, more than 20 years old. Uh, this is a screenshot of uh, the World Championship match. They actually had this live telecast uh, matches. So just to quickly explain the game from this image, um, there is, so you have cards, it's a card game, uh, and you have, you know, cards represent different kinds of resources as well as units. So from the resources, you can construct units, and units um, can be used to attack the opponent. And generally the goal is to reduce your opponent's life total to zero. So you start off with 20 life points or health points, and you, you, know, you attack or you damage the opponent until it reaches zero life, and then you win, right? Okay, so why is this uh, an interesting game to consider from a, from a technical perspective? Um, so actually poker is, I mean, so magic is kind of like poker as well, because you also have a hand, right? So here you see actually Sebastian Tan, who is the youngest competitor at Grand Prix Singapore. This is uh, in June this year. So you can see in his hand, he holds a number of cards. So this is hidden from the opponent, just like in poker. And also you see on his, on his um, right or your left, there's a pile of cards, which is also hidden from both himself and the opponent. Right? That's, that's what we call the library. It's where you get more cards. So you, you, know, you, use, you play the cards in your hand, and then you sort of draw um, a card from your library. So there's obviously the sources of hidden information that makes it um, as tricky as poker. Um, beyond that, uh, so what, what, is, what is on the card, right? Since the card is the main um, entity. So uh, in this case, I just want to focus on the, what's called the text box which is this sort of white box at the bottom of a card. And essentially, the, the real problem is it can have any, any kind of words inside that box. So in this case, there's a sentence that says, you can't lose the game, and your opponents can't win the game. And so this is obviously a very powerful effect. Uh, it's on a card called Platinum Angel. So this card, this effect, comes into play when you manage to cast or summon the angel. Right? 
And here's just one, one, one line of text, right? But it can be any, any text, right? So uh, clearly that makes it really complicated, right? Because um, you might assume that, oh, you know, like, uh, I shouldn't like, go below zero health because otherwise the opponent will win and, and so on. But once you have this on the board, oh, it doesn't matter, I can go to negative 100 health because I cannot lose, right, by the, the power of this card, it says I cannot lose, even if I go to negative 100 health, right? Whereas normally, if you go to zero health, you lose immediately, right? So that's pretty tough. Um, so this is not the only example, right? So you can find many examples. Uh, here's another one that uh, deals with health specifically. So it says, it gives you a new way to win, right? So instead of reducing your opponent to zero health, if you can reduce yourself to one health, you also win, right? So normally you would think losing health is a, is a bad thing, right? Because you don't want to go to zero. Uh, but in this case, it could be a good thing because you might go down to one and then you automatically win. So uh, in, in the literature, this is very closely related to something called general game playing, GGP, where the rules of the game uh, is not fixed in a sense. Uh, the rules are presented to your program at the beginning of the match. So we say, program, here's the game and here are the rules, and play, right? So this is kind of like that. In this case, it's worse because the rules change as the game goes on. So as things appear and disappear on the board, the rules change continuously. Uh, so it can be, this is like, so I'm trying to, know, the analogy here, this is a bit like Go, but worse because uh, you have arbitrary text that can do pretty much arbitrary things. Right. Okay, so we come to the, the main part of the talk. Okay, uh, we're gonna talk about uh, a little open source project I've been working on. Uh, it's called Mage Arena. So it's a contraction of two words, Mage, which is a magic casting player person, and Arena, which is um, a place you battle. So, uh, okay, let me just, yeah, so this, this is actually a single player. Uh, so normally, if you see the, the screenshot, right, this game is played between two people. Um, because, but in, in our project, we kind of focus on the single player aspect. So you play against the computer, right? The AI, which is the whole point of this talk. Um, and I'm going to tell you how we actually built the AI. Okay. Oh, this was a screenshot of uh, what it looks like. If you came in earlier, you saw it playing by itself. That's actually live running on my computer. It's not like a, it's not like a video or anything. So uh, this is what it looks like. So this is basically the, what you see just now, but in a digital form, right? So you have cards and and so on. And the bottom is your hand, which you can see. You can't see the opponent's hand, obviously, because that's hidden, right? And so on. Right, okay, so, so one of the, some of the things that uh, I think we did right in this project, I'd like to share with you, and so that maybe it can help you in, in your projects. So I think at the beginning, one of the things you want to do is actually to know like, where your project stands among all the other projects out there. So this is not the only open source project uh, for this game. So let's look at some of the competition. Right. Okay, one of the earliest projects, I think that in fact, the, the first one I got to know was, uh, was a project called Forge. Forge is um, also an open source project. Uh, it's much older than uh, Mage Arena. So specifically on the AI, how does Forge works? So Forge um, is quite simple. It works on heuristics. So the idea is that an, any particular you know, game position, you can have a number of different moves available. You could cast a card, you could activate an ability, you could attack, and so on. And Forge has a system of scoring each of the moves you can make at, at a current point. And then it sort of greedily picks just the move with the highest score. Right? So I mean, it's quite what you would do if you, if you didn't really know how to do an AI. Right? It's kind of the obvious way of doing it. Um, so that's all right if you have, but it gets really complex if you have, you know, deal with many, many things like, you know, like the platinum angel on the field, you can just attack with wild abandon, right? Or near death experience and really weird rules like that. It, it's kind of hard. You need to write a lot of code, right? Just to say, if you know, this thing is on the field, I got to do something different and so on. Uh, so that's one problem with that approach. So another project, which is, uh, not open source, it's I guess a triple A title. Uh, and this is sort of the official licensed title from the folks that make the game, uh, Stools of the Planeswalkers. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so this actually uses a much more sophisticated approach. If you think about what's the issue with Forge's approach, right, is that, well, if I make a move, the opponent might have a direct counter to my move. Right? He, could, he could destroy my creature, or he could make a counter move right, that negates whatever advantage I gained from making uh, that move, the best move I had, because my opponent could immediately negate that, that advantage, or made it worse, for example. Um, so here I need to go in a little bit of uh, the abstractions, which I think is crucial in any, any software project. So one of the central abstractions of uh, games is the idea of a game tree. So here I'm trying to illustrate that. So if you look at the picture on the bottom, so basically we just draw it as a, as a traditional tree in computer science. So the nodes represent game states or a particular position, right? And then the arrows represent legal moves you know, from one position to the next. So there's an arrow if there's a legal move that um, transits from the current game state to the next game state. So a move could be, so my example on top is the like, say, tic-tac-toe, right? So you, have, you start off, the, the initial state is the blank board, and then in, if you're playing the X player, so the first move could be one of the three uh, moves you see there, right? So these are the valid next states. So you can sort of draw the whole thing out as a tree. And this is a very powerful abstraction because it actually lets us separate the details of the, the algorithm from the game. Because every game you can represent it in this format. As long as your game has a way to say, give me the list of next states right, from a particular state. So the, the, the game playing algorithm actually doesn't care how you do it. As long as it gives you this list of next states, it can do its work. right. So this is actually a very nice abstraction. So what um, the use of the planeswalker do is actually, if you think about it, it's, a it's still a heuristic, but it's a multi-step look ahead. So if you think of Forge, Forge looks at my current state and what is the best move I can make, right? And that has the problem. So to solve that problem, we can always look more than one step. I can consider what I do now and what my opponent is going to do in response to what I have done. And then you can go on the next few steps, what I'm going to do in response to what my opponent has done and so on. Basically by extending the tree downwards, right? By looking at more and more next states. Of course, at some point, you know, it gets so many nodes that it just takes very long. Um, so you have to have some kind of cutoff. Maybe, you know, in this case, I'm showing a two-step cutoff. And then your heuristic, in this case, would assign values to the, the leaf nodes, right? It's not really the end of the game yet, because you, you only look two steps ahead. So you could assign values, uh, like in this picture. And then you could work, out, work backwards and figure out what should be the best move I could make. And this is called the Minimax algorithm. It's been around for very, very long, since the 1960s. And of course, over the years, there have been many um, improvements. But the essential idea is just, it's a heuristic, but with multi-step look ahead, so that I can react to what my opponent's going to do, right? All right. OK, so that's, and in fact, uh, Majorina, at the point when I joined the project in 2011, had an implementation of the Minimax algorithm. Oops, moved too fast. What happened? Sorry. <laughs> All right. Anyway, so uh, Majorina, when I joined, had, had this implementation. So that was great. But it, it didn't really differentiate us from all the other product programs that are around, because they also had like, a very similar AI. Um, so I think it's always good. Uh, the second sort of lesson is always good to keep an eye out on um, what's happening maybe in, in the broader sphere of things, not just in like, all the other magic playing programs, but in the slightly broader sphere of what's happening in, in academia as well, right, in terms of the research literature. Uh, and that's maybe where you can get some competitive advantage from your competitors by bringing in cutting edge ideas from, from research. And I think one day I was just sort of reading, this is a blog post by the author of Forge, which is one of the very earliest projects. And this is in reply to a comment. So he said, you know, there's this thing called UTC that, I, that this guy mentioned, and it sounds like a good idea. Um, and there's this paper, right, that says Monte Carlo search applied to card selection. So I sort of followed, you know, as you do on the web, you follow the links. So I did. Oops. I don't know why I'm messing up the buttons. Yeah, anyway, so this is the article. I think this was written sometime in um, 2005. No, no, 2009, sorry, this is 2009. Yeah. Uh, so they applied this, this idea, this is actually sort of a new idea, 
that came from Go, right? If you recall the game of Go, a lot of work went into the development, and now we're pretty close. And one of the ideas was this um, Monte Carlo tree search. So they, they applied it to a very specific problem called card selection, which is one of the decisions you would make in a game, but not the only one, because you have other kind of decisions like, um, you know, how, when should I attack or when should I defend and things like that. Okay. Right, so let me qu quickly explain to you how uh, Monte Carlo tree search work and very quick, uh, this is a very nice uh, picture from uh, Guillaume Cheslot's thesis. So we have, still have this game tree structure, but instead of having a heuristic, so the problem is how would you design a heuristic function, right? So it's very complex, just like the game has all these really weird cards. You can't really design a heuristic function to assign a, a numerical number. So the way this Monte Carlo technique works is through sim simulations. Okay. So instead of assigning a number up front, we collect some statistics at each node. Right? And the statistics become the kind of the score in a way. Right? So how do we collect these statistics? So imagine that we already have a partial tree. So we perform a selection step, which is to traverse, find the um, interesting portions of the tree to explore. And then we expand the, we you know, ask for the next node, we expand it one step, we perform a simulation, and then um, based on the result of the simulation, right? Because the simulation, which is the end of the game, basically you randomly, randomly make moves for both players, right? Just random. The, here's the amazing thing. You just randomly make moves, right? And the game will eventually end in either one of the players winning. And then you sort of update the statistics, which is the back propagation step. And then you, can, you do this an over and over again. And you get, uh, in the end, you can collect the statistics and use it to, as some kind of a, a score. And you can pick the best, the best move. Okay, so let me show you some results. Oops, haha, <laughs> okay, happens again. Um, okay, let me show you some results. Uh, um, right, so we already had minimax, right? So that's already around. So I'm just gonna normalize against minimax. So minimax, I'll assume, is going to be one. And the, the new algorithm is gonna be uh, versus that. So here's given one second of thinking time. Uh, so at one second thinking time, actually, this is slightly worse, right? How you would read these numbers if it was one and one, it would be like they were evenly matched. If it was one and two, it means out of three games, uh, MCTS wins two, Minimax wins one. Right? It's like kind of an like odds ratio. Right? But the amazing thing was, uh, if you give it more time, actually, this algorithm improves quite a lot because you can perform much more iterations of these uh, simulations. And as you know, in statistics, you need to perform many simulations to get reliable statistics. Right? So when you give it four seconds, it actually can um, outperform Minimax, which was a surprise to me uh, because we, we, I, when I went in, I didn't know what would be the result. It could be just horrible. Uh, but it turns out it could actually work. Uh, the problem was, as you see, that the top blue word is cheating, right? Because I had no way to figure out how you're going to deal with the hidden information. Because this was developed for Go, and Go didn't have any hidden cards or hidden information. So in this first iteration of the AI, it, it can see all the, inf the hidden cards, actually. So there's no hidden information. So I call this the cheating version. Okay, uh, and, I, and I sent an email to uh, Professor Cowling, who wrote the original paper, to tell them about our results. Because to close the loop, right? Because I took their result and applied it to this game, and I said, hey, we extended it, and here's what we got. So that was kind of nice, but I didn't get the reply. But keep in mind this uh, email, March 2012. Okay. <laughs> okay, and the last part, I'll quickly go through, they're running out of time, is to uh, iterate based on feedback from your uh, user base. It's very important. So right after the first version came out with the cheating AI, I got this uh, issue request, issue number 92. I'll always remember this. So <laughs> it says, uh, yeah, I, don't, I don't quite like my AIs to cheat. It seems kind of unfair. So could you have a non-cheating version? Right? So, and this turns out to be like a research problem because nobody knows how to solve this. So I don't know how to solve this either. Uh, but there's hope, right? So, uh, so this is like five months later, August of 2012. So the lesson here is be patient when emailing academics. They don't, they don't send back emails so fast. So, so Professor Cowling was very nice to so send me back an email uh, about five months later. So he said that, you know, we, are like, like we have this new paper come out and uh, you should take a look at it. Of course I did. And this is their paper. Uh, and the key word here is the, notice they have the word imperfect information, right? Which means that actually they worked on this problem uh, and they had a result. And it's actually not that complicated. So I'm gonna focus on the word determinization, the second word in the uh, paper. So back to uh, Monte Carlo Tree Search, MCTS, right? So what is determinization? 
Um, so it turns out that you could take into account the hidden information in the simulation phase, which is the third step. And how you would do that is a process known as determinization. And it's very simple. It just means out of all the, the things you don't know, we assign a random permutation. Right? So I don't know what's in your hand. I don't know what's in your library. But assuming I know what you have in total, I know all the, like, the whole deck, right? I could say randomly assign the missing cards. So randomly give you a random hand and randomly arrange your deck somehow, right? So it's not quite the correct arrangement, but the, the total cards is correct. And because we do many simulations, you can think of it as sampling the space of the hidden information. In each simulation, we uh, sample one possible configuration of the hidden cards. Does that make sense? So over many simulations, actually, you get somewhat decent statistics, even though you don't know exactly what's the hidden information because we sample from the hidden information, right? Um, okay, let me just move on. Uh, so this is, oh. And this is the results for the honest uh, version that didn't have the hidden information. Uh, and it's even more surprising because it does actually better. Right? So the numbers in brackets are from the uh, cheating version. So that was good. It's, actually, it's just a very simple, small tweak if you think about it. Right? So instead of just doing a simulation, I first um, sample from the hidden, I do a permutation of the hidden in cards, and I do a simulation. Right? Just add one more additional step. OK, just to recap quickly, I'm running out of time. Uh, so the first one is to know your competition, right? the different programs or the different products in your space. And try to actually find some new ideas from places people don't normally look. So in this case, my example was taking ideas from the literature, like from, com from computer science papers and things like that, and applying it in, in, in the software. And of course, finally, you, know, you should listen to your feedback and make improvements. Okay, just want to end off by saying, um, so this is an open source project, uh, and this is our GitHub page. So very much welcome to you know, fork the project, uh, send pull requests, and things like that. This is written in Java, by the way. And of course, for everything related to today's talk, actually it's going to be, it's actually on this website right now. I've updated a new post uh, with all the links uh, and other stuff I mentioned today. So you can get uh, the details from, so if there's one sort of URL, you can just remember this one, or you can just Google for Mate Sharina. Right, that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much. Do we have time? Yeah, are there any questions? I think we have time for maybe one or two. I have one question. In Magic Gathering, do you actually know your opponent's full deck? Um, that's a... Uh, I think you can assume so because uh, most people play a certain standard type of deck. Okay. So, and you, you play multiple games normally. So after the first game, you roughly know like, what he has. So you make a sort of an assumption about what, what yes. the full deck is. Yeah, so in this case, we actually do make an assumption that you do know the contents of the, the opponent's deck. But in, in our game, actually, because there's a setup screen, in a setup screen, you get to see both decks. I think so okay. we assume that you observe the other deck. Yeah. No, I guess that's all. Okay, thank you.